This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. The second confrontation that Jesus has in, in this chapter revolved around another form of human authority, the authority of the state. Let's read these verses together. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. But teach the way of the truth of God, uh, the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. I said last week in the close, and I date myself when I, when I do this, that... Uh, that I, I envision Eddie Haskell being the one who asks this question. You remember the <laughs> television program that was on a hundred years ago, Leave it to Beaver. And, and Eddie Haskell was that guy who was always flattering uh, Mrs. Cleaver. Mrs. Cleaver, you have such a beautiful voice. How are you today, Mrs. Cleaver? And and uh, his his flattery would make your skin crawl. I hope you get that feeling right here. These Pharisees and Herodians would make your skin crawl. And this, this second group that confronts him are strange bedfellows, are they not? Because the Pharisees hated the Herodians. In, in fact, they didn't even think of them as living life forms, human life forms. They thought of them as dogs, worse than that. But isn't it interesting how when people have an agenda that they'll get together with even their arch enemies if they are trying to overcome someone else? These were political enemies brought together because they were wanting to confront Jesus. Jesus is now a threat to both these groups. They had a vested interest in trying to trip him up. And they, like the group that preceded them of the religious leaders, thought that they pretty much had him in a dilemma. Here's a question that he's not going to be, answer, be able to answer. It's kind of like they thought it was one of these questions. If a man uh, comes in to see a preacher and he sits down and uh, he, he tells the preacher that he's been having some domestic problems and the preacher turns the question back to him and says to him, have you quit beating your wife? The fellow's in a dilemma, isn't he? No, no matter how he answers it, it reflects poorly upon him. They have got this all figured out, neatly figured out. This is going to get Jesus in trouble because if he says, no, you shouldn't pay the poll tax because, uh, b because it's Caesar on the coin, then we're going to, the Herodians are going to be able to make their case that Jesus was an insurrectionist and that he was causing trouble for the Roman government. So the Pharisees could get the Roman government, the power of the state involved to do what they want to do. They'll let the state take control of this thing and put him to death. So they begin with flattery. We know that no one is as truthful as you. You're not partial in anything. You tell the truth. You just tell it like it is. Is it lawful to pay that that poll tax to Caesar or not. Shall we give or shall we not give? Look at verse 15 and following. But he, 
knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God, God's. And they were amazed at him. You see, that, that coin had Caesar's image on it. Therefore, that coin belonged to Caesar. Humans have God's image. Humans belong to God. But the Bible also teaches that we, we must be in submission to our human governments. Romans chapter 13, verse 1, for example. Every person is to be in subjection to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. And then there's another passage in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 that we should read. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do do right. Christians are to be subject to civil rulers, uh, whether they're good or bad. When, when Peter made his statement, he's referring to a king in authority, the, the notorious Nero, a wretched, immoral, degenerate king. And Peter says that you have to submit to him as that authority. And while it's not true that civil governments are ordained of God, it's true that civil governments are established by God. God permits them. And God permits them to have limited control over human beings. The civil government can only control what you do physically. It can't control what you do mentally or spiritually. Now, the civil government may, may try to manipulate you mentally or spiritually, but that's when, and, and our governments do that, don't they? They try to change your philosophy and view, and that's when they step over the line. They have no right to do that. They can't do that. And when you recognize that they're trying to do that, that's when you, when you obey God rather than men. The state can't legislate where we worship. Oh, when they do, uh, we can arrange to worship in our hearts in our minds, in a way that remains faithful to God. The state can't govern your conscience. Our conscience uh, are, are governed by the ultimate authority in our lives, God. We're, give, we're to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and we're to give to God what is God's. Certain things properly belong to Caesar. Other things belong to God. And you see, then that's the second authority that Jesus runs into that day. The first we saw last episode, the religious authorities, the false manipulative religious authorities. The second, the state. We're going to look at another authority that comes on the scene to try to trip Jesus up in our next section. Please watch this. The next authority that Jesus confronts in this chapter is what we would call rationalism or human reasoning, the, the power and authority of the thinking of men, the opinions of men that are bound as authority. Read these verses with me. Some Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died leaving no children. The second one married her, 
and died leaving behind no children, and the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven married her. You have to know something about the Sadducees, I think, here to understand the question. And again, isn't it interesting that you, you have these three groups in succession now that come to Jesus and every one of them thinks that they're so bright <laughs> to put Jesus in a box. They've got him in a dilemma. Every single one comes with a question that they're just sure he cannot handle and that's going to expose him in such a way that they can now do what they want to do to him. And that is to put him to death. They're going to get that accomplished. You know the end of the story. But you see these initial fledgling efforts and the lame attempts to do what they want to do. This is the only time in uh, Mark's record that the Sadducees appear. And this is entirely characteristic of the way that the Sadducees operated in the first century. The Sadducees were not a large Jewish group, but they were a powerful Jewish group. They were the aristocratic group among the Jews. They were the wealthy Jews. They were extremely powerful because the high priest always came from the Sadducees. And there you can see how then, while not being large, they were very sophisticated and powerful. They, uh, they might be considered as uh, we might look at modernists today. Uh, we would call them rationalists. Mark describes the Sadducees as those who say there is no resurrection. As recorded over in Acts chapter 23 and verse 8, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So the Sadducees who don't believe in these things come to Jesus with this very silly question about a woman who survives as the wife of seven brothers. Now notice how extreme the case becomes. How, um, uh, how the hypothetical is a hypothetical to the extreme. I answer a lot of questions through our website and, uh, that are generated from the, uh, from the television program and I, I get hypothetical questions posed to me regularly. I don't like hypothetical questions. And so I, I don't answer them out of, uh, out of the same resources that I answer legitimate, real life questions. Because hypotheticals are established to try to trip you up, to make your, your application of a biblical principle look foolish. And that's exactly what they're trying to do here. According to the Leverite, Leverite laws, if a man married a woman and, and he died and he left no heir, the Leverite law said his brother was to marry the woman and have a child so that there would be an heir for the man's family, for his name, so his name would continue. That's what's at stake here. So this question really has nothing to do with Jesus' authority to teach, but what they're trying to do is show that he can't handle, he can't handle the application of the Leverite law. So in the resurrection, who's she going to be married to? They didn't even believe in the resurrection, but they're going to ask a question with regard to the resurrection? You, you see the hypocrisy here? And the, the reason they ask it that way is they're just sure that they're, because they know that there is never going to be a resurrection. There's not going to be an afterlife as described by the rest of Judaism that he's not going to be able to answer this in a satisfactory way. And you can see their sneering contempt as they ask it. 
Look at the way he answers. Jesus said to them, Is it not, is this not the reason you are mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the book about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. Jesus begins to answer this irrelevant question. And he makes it clear in his reply that they're mistaken because you don't understand the scriptures and you don't understand the power of God. Again, that would have ticked them off. Because they're the ones, especially the Sadducees, who believe that they had the proper interpretation of the Scriptures. Everybody else was wrong. It was their little group who saw things clearly, and they reverenced their teachers. After all, the high priest was from their sect, and he was the one. He was the main man in Judaism. And I, I wonder sometimes how, um, when I see religious leaders answer questions and they dance around the questions with regard to morality. Let's say a religious leader ask a, a question regarding morality and, uh, and he chooses not to answer in a direct way. I wonder, I wonder where they get the idea that it's, um, it's a good idea not to be direct with God's word, with an answer. Jesus is direct. You don't know God's word, and you don't understand the power of God. They were wrong, they were badly mistaken, and Jesus told them so to their face. He didn't say, oh, you wonderful Sadducees, you you do so many wonderful benevolent things and you are such a strength to everyone and I just choose not to. He doesn't follow the normal course of the religionist today. You see what he does? You're wrong. You don't understand God's word and you don't understand the power of God. Their immediate mistake, their first mistake was that they didn't understand the word of God and they thought they did. They didn't understand the Word of God with, with regard to the resurrection. And their ultimate cause of their error was because they didn't really believe in God's power. I want to suggest to you that in Christianity today, all of the errors that are out there revolve around these two concepts. Folks who appear to know a lot about what the scriptures say, but don't understand or don't respect what the scriptures say. The number of false concepts that are taught in the name of Christianity are too nu numerous to list. And those things that cause division among God's people at the heart of those things is a lack of regard for what the scriptures teach. It's very significant that in his confrontation with both the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that Jesus regarded the scriptures as the final arbitrator of authority in things religious. How many times have you heard me say on this program over the years, into our second decade now, that we go back to what God's Word says for authority. That's where the authority is. The authority doesn't, doesn't rest in, in synods or conventions or councils. The authority rests in God's Word. That's what Jesus appeals to. When they came to him with a question, he, re, he 
countered that question with something that took them back to the scriptures. So when the rich young ruler asked about eternal life, Jesus replied, what is written in the law? When the Pharisees inquired about his views on divorce, his response was, what did Moses command you? It's the same right here. When the Sadducees said what they said to him, he said, have you not read in the book of Moses? And here's the other thing that you need to understand about the Sadducees. They, they believed that only the book of Moses was authority. The book of Moses, the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Old Testament. The only part of the Old Testament that they accepted. There was not evidence. They were certain of a resurrection in those five books. But let's go back to that when we come back in just a second and illustrate where you find the truth in the first five books of, the, of uh, Moses. Come back in just a second. Jesus was quoting from, from Exodus 3 and verse 6 when God spoke to Moses and said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And, and the tense that God spoke in was the present tense. So Jesus goes to those books that they accept as canonical, as inspired, as authoritative. Books that they knew said nothing about the resurrection, and Jesus proves the resurrection from those verses. How did he do that? By the tense. I am, God said. Which means, at the present, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. Which proves the doctrine of the resurrection. Because God is not a God of the dead, he's a God of the living. So they didn't understand the scripture, is what he was telling them. They prided themselves in understanding the scripture, but they didn't understand it. They thought, because in physical life there are all kinds of complications, that those physical complications completely discredited the resurrection because, because they didn't understand the power of God. That's the second thing that he says they don't understand. They thought that physical consequences had to be carried into eternity. And if the Leverite law, which had to be practiced among the Jews, was practiced and, and the scenario that they presented at Jesus left no air, then there's all kinds of problems because those physical things must be carried into the next realm. But they didn't understand the power of God, did they? Because in the next life, things change. The Sadducees, first of all, were ignorant of the scriptures. And second of all, they were ignorant of the power of God. And Jesus said in Mark 12 and verse 25, for when they raise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. In other words, life and death will change those physical relationships and responsibilities. Human beings become like angels in relationship after life. Mortals will become immortal, or as Paul said it, they will be raised imperishable, 1 Corinthians 15. When the resurrection comes, everything changes. Our physical bodies are different. They're not the same. There's something similar about them, but they, by the power of God, are changed. You see, they didn't understand that God can continue to change things throughout all eternity. They didn't understand God's word, and they didn't understand his power. And... I wish I had time to develop this thought further, but there's been a lot of Sadducees in the centuries that have followed that have been equally as clever, but as just as foolish in their reasonings. Jesus did not submit to human authority, only to God. See you next week on What Do the Scriptures Say? 
We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.